right, well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming this evening, All right? Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Mike, for a, a couple of fascinating, fascinating talks, um, things that are exciting, that are illuminating, but we also got some uh, cautionary tales. Um, and I would actually like to, to begin with asking you both about a couple things to be, be concerned about. Um, you know, Shannon, you ran through a whole list of potential pitfalls with AI. One of the ones that wasn't on there, but I know you've done some thinking and writing about, is moral de-skilling. Hmm? Um, and I'm wondering if we can start with, with talking about that and concerns about AI and the potential for moral de-skilling. Sure. Well, I think, you know, Mike spoke about the way that uh, the future is really one that is being designed to relieve us of a lot of the decisions in our daily lives that, that we make for ourselves, uh, a lot of the problems that uh, historically humans have had to solve, uh, everything as trivial from what to eat for breakfast uh, to you know, how to uh, respond to a difficult social uh, challenge or uh, help our, our child who's struggling uh, with, with a problem at school. And it won't be very long before we're being encouraged to rely on uh, very specific forms of mach machine intelligence, either to advise us in those decisions or quite frequently uh, to make those decisions for us. Uh, um, and the promise, of course, is that that frees us up, right? That liberates us. That allows us to spend our time and energy on, on other things. But it's important to recognize that humans develop moral intelligence, practical intelligence, emotional intelligence, uh, problem-solving abilities by confronting difficult problems and challenges and being forced to find solutions for ourselves. So one of the uh, dangers that I've written about is the danger that, especially when we have tools that solve morally loaded problems for us, whether it's figuring out uh, whether to, uh, to give bail to a criminal uh, defendant, uh, or what sort of sentence to give that person, or uh, whether to uh, give someone a loan to start a new business, or uh, whether to uh, uh, offer someone a certain sort of support uh, who's struggling uh, with some, some mental health issues. Uh, these sorts of things are increasingly uh, being offered by automated systems. And it's very tempting, even if the human is nominally responsible for the decision, it's very tempting for the human to offload the cognitive and moral labor of solving those problems onto the machine. Especially if we think the machines are more objective, uh, uh, less prone to error, uh, and often we find that humans are eager to rid themselves of the burdens of especially challenging moral problems. Um, but my, my great fear is that uh, humans are going to need more moral strength and intelligence and wisdom to deal with the future that Mike described uh, than we have today, not less, which means we're going to need more practice in challenging the most complex moral problems our society presents. And the more of that labor that we offload to machines, perhaps the, the more uh, we will endanger the future that we need. Mike, what is it that, that sets off alarm bells for you? Oh, well, on a lot of this future stuff, uh, you find yourself ambivalent. On the one hand, you were talking about uh, moral reasoning and moral judgment. On the positive side, I like to think, well, we'll have more free time. We'll be able to think higher thoughts. You know, our machines will help us rehearse answers to things and see what the, you know, what might come out of them. It might challenge us. It might give us options we couldn't imagine before. That's, that's when the angel's on this shoulder. The devil over here says, you know, do we really want to have rule by algorithm? You know, I think, I think objectivity gets a little bit uh, uh, overemphasized. There's a lot to be said for things that computers don't have, like mercy. And I worry that we will, we will lose those abilities. We will lose those, those strengths and allow our machines to take over responsibility for things that we should be carrying. So one of the members of the audience here wants to know, are we fooling ourselves that we're actually preparing the current and future generations to lead humanely in this brave new world? Well, I think there's a real risk of that. And I speak about that uh, quite often to uh, business and industry leaders who uh, say that actually the students that they're getting 
don't always have the skills that they really need in order uh, to, to manage these new technical challenges. A lot of times they have the, uh, the technical knowledge, uh, the, the high level scientific and mathematical uh, um, uh, training, but often what they're missing are the sort of broader range of skills that a liberal arts education brings to the table, the ability to communicate, the ability to work through conflicting values and priorities, the ability to negotiate among different stakeholders with very different interests. And that has to be done in almost every job, even in technical jobs. You're on a team. You need to figure out how to solve this problem together. And fewer and fewer problems are going to be of the sort that one person is empowered to solve as an individual. So I think in some sense, if we focus on, for example, developing STEM capacities in students without uh, wrapping them in that envelope that a liberal arts edu education provides, uh, then we won't be serving our students for the future. In fact, a lot of the sort of just strict computation, coding, a lot of that stuff's already becoming automated, right? Uh, tomorrow's computers will program themselves. They'll write their own code. You'll need a human to evaluate that code and see what it's going to do in the world and know what that means. That's the skill you're going to need uh, from people with coding expertise. Well, Mike, one of the cover stories that you did for our magazine is why Silicon Valley loves the humanities and also have written for the Wall Street Journal about that. Maybe you can kind of pick up on that. Oh, I'll give you a real good reason for a liberal arts education in 2018. Um, I just wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal. I think it comes out on the 10th. Uh, talked to two gentlemen. One of them was, is a legendary Silicon Valley figure. Another one is the uh, CEO of a $2 billion software company. And they both, interestingly, said the same thing. And that is that people's careers actually have two phases. There's the first phase where you take your college education and your technical skills and you apply them. And you get better at what you do and you get a better reputation and you move up through the ranks of the technical side of your company. But at about the 15 year mark, you suddenly hit a ceiling. No matter how good you are, you're becoming a bit obsolete. You're not quite on the technological edge. You can't, you're not really adding a, an equal amount of productivity to your career by the year. At that point, you have to transition. And you transition into your secondary skills, which are your people skills, your ability to lead, your ability to run teams, your ability to motivate people, all those things that we think of as management skills. And if you can't make that transition, or if you're not prepared because you didn't get trained to make that transition, then no matter how good you are, your career is just going to plateau. The only way to fully realize all of your dreams and capabilities is if you have those secondary skills and you bring them to the fore. Having a career in programming is, you know, it, it's nice to have a degree in it. You're going to get a running start. But at a certain point, you better have some humanities. You better have some liberal arts education to prepare you for that second half of your life. So one of the audience members here wants to know, do you believe consumers will one day own and be paid for their data profile? Yes, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm going to say something that's probably heretic, but, heretical, but I really think that information has to have a value. I think it has to be monetized. I think every time you do a Google search, you're going to have to be charged. It may be a quarter of a penny, but if we don't, if we don't bring monetization to the web, then we get the opposite side problem, which is, information becomes free, including your information. And you know, a company right across the street over here takes all of your personal information and they sell it to advertisers and everything else, and they're not paying you a dime. So until we attach money to the internet, this, is, this kind of uh, lack of, of privacy is just going to accelerate. Well, I think, yeah, this is the, the risk, is that it already, in some sense, it is monetized. It's just that the transactions aren't benefiting the people who are generating the value, right? Um, or at least not in the way that we think. Uh, and it's going to be very difficult to make that transition, right? If, you're, if you've already given away these things for free, it becomes very difficult to negotiate uh, a return to, to your ownership of this stuff. Um, so I, I agree with Mike that um, at some point that transition is going to need to happen, but it's going to be a very, very difficult one. And consumers are going to have to fight for it. 
So with, with the transition to, to, a, to increasing use of AI and, and automation, one of the audience members wants to know, you know, what about whole classes of jobs that are going to be destroyed, truckers, factory workers, uh, physician's assistants, et cetera? What's the ethical response to that? Well, there's an ethical response, I think, uh, that needs to come uh, from government and policymakers. Uh, there's an ethical response that needs to come from industry, and then there's an ethical response that needs to come from citizens and voters uh, who decide uh, how to prepare uh, for that tr sort of transition. Uh, there's no realistic scenario where large categories of jobs don't disappear. Um, I think that I think very few things are inevitable, and I usually resist the language of inevitability because a lot of times. Uh, we take the easy road by imagining that something's inevitable rather than figuring out a better way to do something. Uh, but I think the, the uh, impact on the labor market is going to be severe, uh, and there's, there's no real way around that. The question is, when do we start preparing for it, how wisely do we prepare for it, and whose interests are taken into account? And that's where the ethics comes in, right? Uh, because right now we don't have a political system or an economic system that is taking into account all of the interests that are morally legitimate, all of the people who have dignity, uh, who need purpose in life, who need uh, a, a sense of hope, a sense of uh, basic security, and, and we're denying large classes of people access to those kinds of goods. So I think uh, this is a reckoning that's coming. Um, in, some ways, in some ways, I think it could be a good thing, I think, as I highlighted in my talk, right? We're gonna get forced to a point where we recognize that our current track is unsustainable. And I hope that at that point, we commit to making some fundamental changes in the values of our society and the way they're embedded in the political and economic order. Uh, but as Mike said, there are gonna be some real growing pains involved in that transition. Well, and it sounds like we're getting into the territory of social dislocation, like you thought. Yeah, uh, you know, up until now, there's been kind of a class element to this that we didn't really worry about automation that much, as long as it was guys digging ditches and welding quarter panels on F-150 pickups. Now all of a sudden, radiologists are out of work, doctors, dentists, lawyers, lawyers you know, more and more the, the professions are, beginning yeah. dis, are starting to get displaced. And my awful feeling is that, you know, we could have a permanent unemployed class of people, 30%, 40%. Uh, I wrote a piece in the Harvard Business Review and I called them Zevs, which is zero economic value people which is they can't contribute, no matter how much education they have, no matter what skills they have, there's no way they can actually contribute to the economy anymore because whatever they do, computers are doing better or robots are doing better. So what happens to these people? Well, there's talk of guaranteed annual income, but that strikes me as deeply soul hollowing. I mean, if you're sitting around playing World of Warcraft on your wall-sized TV in your apartment and you have no disposable income except your check once a month, Seems to me that it kind of removes any kind of agency to your life, any kind of you know, value. So what do we do with these people? We have to find them something to do. And maybe that's nonprofit work that's paid in some kind of way. There's, there's a solution out there, but, and I, I trust humanity to find that solution, but we're not there yet. And uh, that could be the biggest social problem of the second half of this century. Let me just add to that that I think this is a, an opportunity also to revisit what sort of work we think is worthwhile um, and, and what sort of compensation it deserves. Uh, right now, uh, the caring professions, for example, are some of the least well-paid professions in our society. Um, what is the last thing that machines are going to get good at? Taking care of us in all of the ways that, that really matter. Um, so maybe we can start thinking about the, the real value of care in our society and actually compensating people for cultivating the, the skill of care, whether it's mental health care, uh, whether it's the kind of care that we give in the educational system, right? Um, kindergarten teachers right now, considering the importance of what they do and then looking at what they get paid, that's just a straight up travesty. And AI might liberate us from the need to direct our best and brightest into professions that are primarily about making stuff that can be sold. Machines will be doing all the making stuff that can be sold. We can redirect human intelligence, wisdom, and talent into the sorts of things that machines can't do for us and that we really haven't been doing very well 
because of our emphasis on economic productivity in a sort of consumptive consumption model of society. Yeah, Mike. I think a good sign is that the notion of a job is beginning to fade away, a full-time job, and we're moving increasingly towards you know, the, the gig economy. We still haven't quite figured out the whole micropayment system where you get hired to you know, come up with a sentence for a headline and you're paid 50 bucks and it automatically goes into your bank account and the government you know, keeps track of that stuff and all that. We haven't purified that process and made it really efficient. But as we do, I think it'll, it'll give us some options in this new economy that we don't have now. So we'll uh, take time for uh, just two more questions because I want to make sure you folks have time for the reception as well and a chance to talk with Mike and Shannon individually. Someone here wants to know, what are, what are your thoughts on an AI or robot tax? Mm. Robot. Robot tax. tax. Uh -huh. Yeah, this has been proposed uh, uh, in, a, in a few communities. Um, I actually think it's it's well-meaning and well-intentioned, but I, I don't think it's the, the solution. I think there are other kinds of economic uh, changes that need to be made. But the problem with taxing the robots is you are, you are creating a disincentive to develop the technology that can actually be used in beneficial ways. Um, and you're, you're penalizing the people who want to innovate. And I don't think that is the way that our society should solve this problem. Uh, but I think that there are lots of other ways that we can look at our current economic order and recognize that we need to be able to, uh, to creatively envision a new kind of system that is just not a trivial change to our current one. So uh, Mike mentioned universal basic income. I, I agree with Mike. I actually don't support the sort of standard version of that. I'd, I'd much rather have a, a system where we're um, giving people some meaningful uh, work that actually improves society rather than just paying for their minimum basic needs. Um, but I do think that one good thing about the universal basic income idea is it's a sign that people are willing to entertain some, some big changes to the way that we govern our society and the way that we distribute our wealth. And those kinds of changes are going to be needed uh, in order to flourish in the next century. So as we wrap up, yes. I was going to say, I think in our current global marketplace, any kind of reactionary fiscal policy that punishes innovation is national suicide. If we don't do it, you know, the rest of the world will, will, re, will reinforce the use of robotics to, you know, defeat us. So here we are still at the beginning of 2018. So in, in 30 seconds or less, right? What's one prediction that you have that, uh, that most people don't have on, the, on their radar yet? Something that we're going to see connected with AI, with the Valley? Uh, what's what's one, one surprise that uh, you, you see on the horizon? Oh, I'll, just, I'll make mine very pedestrian. By the end of the year, 15% drop in the value of your house. Hmm. All right. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a bubble. It's going to deflate, but if the history of the Bay Area is, uh, you know, every time you have a downturn, it goes down 15%, then it takes off again after that and goes up 50%. So you just hang on. <laughs> You'll be fine. I think one thing that uh, we haven't really confronted, especially as so much emphasis has been on uh, the impact of uh, autonomous vehicles on the labor market, I don't think we've confronted uh, what's going to happen to retail. Uh, you already see Amazon uh, developing its new store. Uh, if you've heard about this, right, there's, there's no one in the store. There's just stuff. You walk in, uh, and computers analyze right. uh, your entry, what you've taken, charge you for it on your way out, and no person ever interacts with you. Um, for, for retailers, and retailers are already struggling in a lot of different industries, uh, for retailers it's going to become increasingly challenging to defend having people in that retail setting. And think about how many people in this country survive and put food on their kids' uh, plates uh, and put, keep a roof over their heads by doing retail work. People who've never been able to reach the level where they can get a college education, where they can get, where they, uh, they don't live in the kind of urban centers where there are a lot of other opportunities for work. Uh, this is a real labor crisis that's coming uh, in, in retail and, and we, need to, we need to be thinking about it. I think um, Google and Amazon and uh, LinkedIn and um, 
especially Twitter, are going to regret getting involved in politics. I think we're going to see a call, increasing calls. They're so big. They're some of the biggest enterprises in human history. We're going to see growing calls to break them up. All right. Well, please join me in thanking Mike Malone and <laughs> Shannon Valor. And thank you to all of you for being here this evening. Uh, for those of you who are uh, on social media, right, and want to, want to share this evening, there is a hashtag that, that we've created. We also brought uh, with us up to Mountain View, uh, we brought a little bit of, the, of Mission Santa Clara over there in the reception, right? So you can pose in front of the mission even right here in Mountain View. So uh, we look forward to chatting with you over there. We look forward to connecting with you through the magazine and online. And thank you, thank you for your support and for making Santa Clara the incredible place that it is. Thank you.